Sometimes the values that define our culture and define our life, they do come up at odds with the fundamental values of Jesus. And how did Jesus sum up the entire Old Testament? He said, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. That's really what I am inviting myself into a conversation about. How can I start to love my neighbor with every, every part of my life? DL, I follow you on Twitter. Uh oh. And you are a bit of an evangelical nerd, which right? I love. It's true. <laughs> it's true. Thank you for recognizing. Yeah. <laughs> all, all things. I mean, you have an Adventures and Odyssey podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. But it's so, not just Adventures and Odyssey. I mean, we talk about Carmen. We talk about McGee and me. I mean, <laughs> we get we get all in there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So tell, tell us a little bit about your life growing up. Like, what was it like? What was your faith like? What was the culture you were exposed to? That kind of stuff. Yeah, so I grew up, you know, very evangelical. My dad's a pastor. Um, so I was a, a pastor's kid. We were homeschooled. And yeah, I, I think Christianity was by far the defining aspect of my life. And it it, it impacted my family's every decision. And so when I was very young, I decided I want to be a missionary. That kind of was my life goal. I ended up doing uh, youth with a mission right out of high school. And then after that, I went to Bible college and got my degree in intercultural studies. And, you, you know, from day one, I just thought I, I want to be out there doing what you're supposed to do if you love God, which is telling other people about God. And so it really shaped my entire life imagination and trajectory. And I, I mean, I'm still so grateful for it today. That doesn't mean we can't go back and sort of critique some of it. Uh, so it's a fine balance I try and, and walk, but um, you know, just being very honest about my heritage and saying there's so much good that was a part of it. I also, you know, I grew up American. There's no way that this culture didn't impact me along with you know, my faith. So you went to Bible college. I read your first book, first book as well, Assimilate or Go Home. Um, and that was deeply impactful for me personally. Um, and you talk a little bit about that journey from very conservative to um, being exposed to other cultures would be the easiest way to say it. Uh, what, what was that like? And how has it made you more confident in your faith maybe? Yeah, so so my first book is called Assimilate or Go Home Notes from a Failed Missionary. And it's a really, you know, provocative title that actually my publisher chose for me. Uh, you know, I don't like going around thinking of myself as a failure, but it's kind of true. And it's honestly something I wasn't really prepared for because of the culture I was raised in. It was very much focused on if you go out there, you preach the good news, you show the Jesus film, you know, people will convert, everything will be awesome. And so I started doing that. I started, you know, quote unquote, practicing on recently arrived refugees in my city uh, who came from just some very uh, different backgrounds for me. Let's just put it that way. They were mostly Muslim, um, tribal, rural, very, you know, collectivistic society where I'm coming from this very individualistic Western society, you know, and, and I would show them things like the Jesus film and they'd be like, okay, that's great you're a Christian, I'm a Muslim, you know, and, and nothing at my Bible college was really preparing me for like, okay, then what do you do next? What do you do? And uh, I really felt like the spirit of God was saying like, you hang around, you just keep going and you keep hanging out, even though they're not converting in the ways that you were hoping to see this instantaneous way that they would become just like me. But it was this incredible experience for me to be invited into these apartments, into these homes of, of refugees. Um, and stick around long enough for them to be like, yeah, you should keep coming. You should keep coming over. And I eventually got married and moved into these apartments with all my friends. And um, they really showed me a, a part of my city that I didn't know existed where life was very, very hard for people. There was this, this guy who he was 19 years old when he came to the United States from Somalia. And after a few years, I asked him, you know, like, what's, what's better, like life in the refugee camp or life in, in Portland, Oregon. And I totally thought I knew what he would say, which is Portland's so much better. And he just looked at me and he said, you know what? They're both the same. They're both very, very hard, very hard places to survive. And I think that really started to break something open within me to recognize how hard it can be for people who have been marginalized in our society. So, I mean, starting with my own neighborhood, my own city, and then kind of broadening out to America as a whole. I really see that. 
So I assume those experiences led you into writing Myth of the American Dream, some of the things that you saw between, you know, even what you grew up with, even though you may have been on the poorer side compared to true poverty um, and true, well, marginalization, that's the right word. Um, but talk us through the journey of this book. What was the initial seed that was like, we have to talk about this? Um, in Bible college, I actually had this experience where I would read the gospels in particular, and I started to like really freak out because when I read the gospels, the people I most identified with were the religious people who were constantly like really annoyed by Jesus and like really threatened and would like, oh my gosh, you're making us really upset because we thought we knew what you were going to say and, and you go somewhere totally else. But I was at a Bible college where everybody else was reading the Bible and studying the Bible and nobody else seemed very concerned about that. Like <laughs> they just assumed that like they were cool with Jesus and what Jesus was asking people to do with their lives. And I just thought, I think Jesus is saying some really intense stuff. And if I was back then, I would definitely be one of the people who thought I was on God's side. I was doing it right. And, you know, I would probably be challenged. And so that really changed the way I read the scriptures. And then when I went back and read, there's this, this one passage in particular in Luke 4. It's when Jesus is basically announcing his ministry. He goes into the synagogue. You know, there's all these people that knew him even growing up. And they give him a scroll out of Isaiah 58. And he reads it. And he says, you know, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim good news to the poor, to set at liberty the captives, restore sight to the blind, and to set the oppressed free. And it's this gorgeous passage. And after being friends with refugees for a few years, when I read that, I just thought, oh my gosh, like I know people who fit all those categories now, right? People who've experienced forced migration have been captives. They have had their safety, you know, like threatened. They, they've been oppressed and, and they were very, very poor. And so I thought, oh my gosh, Jesus is here. And Jesus is saying, He's good news for my friends. So that really gave me this faith and this love of God and this love of Jesus for my friends, which, you know, emboldened me to keep being in relationship. But then I just like did this little thought experiment, you know, I'm like, okay, so that's where Jesus said he was going to be. And I can assume that that's where Jesus' work is going to be continuing, right? In these spaces. Um, you know, I wonder what the opposite of those places are. So like, what's the opposite of poor? You know, it's the rich. What's the opposite of a captive? It's somebody who's free. You know, what's the opposite of uh, the blind? I, I thought maybe like wellness or like safety, you know, trying to be safe and whole. And then the opposite of oppressed would be oppressors or people who have power. And so I just was like thinking about those values or these, these places of, um, you know, affluence, autonomy, safety, and power. And it was just like straight to the heart. It's like, oh my gosh, these are values that shape my life. These are the spaces I'm desperately trying to orient my life towards. Um, and, and I would say even my Christian culture and background was, was telling me, yes, yes, you should. You should be moving towards those places. But I thought, that seems like it's going in the opposite direction of Jesus. So what do I really want here? And so the book really came out of this exploration of sometimes the values that define our culture and define our life, they do come up at odds with the fundamental values of Jesus. And how did Jesus sum up? you know, the entire Old Testament. He said, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And so that's really what I am inviting myself into a conversation about. How can I start to love my neighbor with every, every part of my life? Um, and it's not just showing the Jesus video, right? There's all these really practical things that you can do too. Like, where do you buy a house? Where do you send your kids to school? Like, <clears throat> how do you spend your money? So yeah, I, I was just interested in maybe taking that theoretical and also making it practical. So if we do bind our lives with others who are uh, less fortunate to use a cheesy term, <laughs> um, moving into the next section of the book, how do you balance that with safety? Like, you know, if we're, if you're moving into the bad neighborhood, that's whose crime rates are five times, 10 times higher in, in some cities than my suburban outpost, Am I called to do that? Are we all called to do that? If we are, how do we balance that? What does that look like to you? Yeah, I, I think I'm really curious about like the fears we focus on. And so again, safety is just like a really normal biological desire that we all have. Um, and yet, I, it's not like a value I hear Jesus talking about very much. Um, and in fact, oh my gosh, if you read like the New Testament, what happened to all of Jesus' followers? Oh my gosh. And what did, what did Jesus and Paul say was going to happen if you are a Christian? 
committed to following the nonviolent, self-sacrificial way of Jesus. Like we are not promised safety. Mm-hmm. Okay, I do think there is of course, a common sense approach. Uh, and I have two kids. And so um, I want to keep them safe. But yeah, we did. We have lived in neighborhoods that have been considered, you know, full of crime. Um, this apartment complex we lived in Portland was really infamous for a while because the police were called there like so many times. Uh, but when we moved in there, we just saw a lot of families who came from immigrant and refugee backgrounds. We got to know our neighbors. Uh, we really needed them and they really needed us and they have our backs. And so um, even though we moved into a house around the corner, like now all of our neighbors know us. Um, I would never feel unsafe because people are watching out for us because they know us. We became a part of the community, right? We're always out in it. We're always walking. We're very much a part of the school. And so now I look at like suburbs where people... Uh, are always inside their homes and, uh, you know, always using their backyard where they don't know their neighbors. And that seems scarier to me. Like, how can you feel safe if you don't know your neighbors? And so for me, really one of the fundamental building blocks is um, being a relationship. And um, there has to be mutuality there. So people need to know that I need them just as much as, you know, they might need something I have to offer. You know, maybe coming from my framework, it was, you know, being a missionary. It's like, I have all the goods to bring to you. You know, that's just a hierarchy and that doesn't really create a mutual relationship. But now I'm like, I'm just a neighbor. My kid goes to the same school as yours. Like, yeah, I, I want to make it as awesome as it can be. Let's do it together. Um, so mutuality, I think is really important in this discussion. Yeah, that's a good point. It makes me look around right now. We've, I, you know, like you already said, we're all in quarantine right now, self-isolating. I know. Uh, so I've talked to my neighbors more in the last month than I have in the previous seven years. Um, oh, wow. I know. That's it's fascinating. Like, we all know each other's names, but it's like, hey, how you doing? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. You know, but now we all come outside and they stand in their driveway and I stand in ours and we talk, you know, and I know more about them now than I have ever. Um, and it's the pace of it. But thinking about safety is like, one of my neighbors, he's really handy. He's like, Hey man, I'll come over and help you build a garden. Cause my wife wants a garden. I'm like, oh, oh my like, gosh. That's, you know, it, it's so one, I'm a huge introvert. So that's already <laughs> awkward for me. But two, <laughs> just the idea of mutuality in, in the sense of like, it's weird that you don't know your neighbors. Why do you feel safe in that? That's a, that's a, something to chew on for me. <laughs> yeah. And suburbs were actually designed for isolation. It's the total encapsulation of the American dream being an individual dream, right? And so, you know, where I live now is actually a suburb of Portland, but now it's where people in poverty have been pushed out because the urban core has become very desirable, right? You can walk around at coffee shops and all that. So now people in poverty have been pushed into these larger car- apartment complexes and then there's a bunch of houses and nothing else, right? We don't have grocery stores, uh, there's no public parks because the suburbs was like, well, you have a backyard, so right. why do we need a public? So it's kind of fascinating. I live in Portland, Oregon, and we don't have any access to public parks or community centers or any of those things because the suburbs were like, oh, you'll be on your own. And, you know, you build your own little kingdom and you never leave that. It's just not designed for community. And it really does kind of bite you in the butt eventually, I think. Yeah. Um, where can people find you? Where, where do they follow you, buy your stuff, listen to you? Yeah, um, so I do have this book coming out that you can get, The Myth of the American Dream. Um, I am on Twitter. I'm very spicy on Twitter, so follow at your uh, caution, I guess, at DL Mayfield. I'm on Instagram. I have a website. Um, and yeah, if you want to listen to a podcast about Ventures on Odyssey and some of this weird stuff, deconstructing some of the dominant theology, it's called The Prophetic Imagination Station. And I do that with my husband, Crispin, who is a therapist and he's really cool and not as intense as me. So. Thanks for watching this episode of Can I Ask You Something? We know that as a Christian, you want to understand and love others better, but it can be hard to find biblical answers to the tough questions that get in the way. So in Can I Ask You Something, We listen with love to personal stories and expert opinions so that through their answers and through their wisdom, we can become more compassionate, more loving, and more confident as we follow Jesus. If you have a question or you're in a situation that's really difficult or maybe taboo, let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you around.